it's three. Some are given only once, and others have to be received as often as possible, like repentance and confession and communion. And others, we don't even have to necessarily receive at all to be saved. We don't have to get married. We don't have to become priests. Uh, we, um, but every believer, there are some of them, they have to. <clears throat> so, um, like we said, there's none of them are created equal. And we said the peak of all of them, the peak of our life in Christ, our life on earth, and the glimpse of heaven is the sacrament of the Eucharist. And everything either leads up to or stems from it. <clears throat> we say this is the central mystery and the peak of all of them. And before we uh, jump into this, um, uh, I'll give a concept uh, that we often find in the church. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned it here before in this meeting, but uh, I mentioned to the servants, uh, and St. Paul even in, in a lot of his writings in, in, in the epistles, breaks down his writing into two main parts, um, theory or faith and practice, okay? Um, or in another sense, <clears throat> as the Lord Jesus Christ told the Samaritan woman, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Um, St. Cyril writes a whole uh, volume um, titled this Worship in Spirit and Truth. Um, and we say basically our faith shapes our life and our beliefs sh also shape our worth worship. So in an another way of saying this, we say there's orthodoxy, what we believe, and then there's orthopraxy, or what we practice. And the two are related, and you can't have one successful without the other. Okay, why am I bringing this up today? Is because <clears throat> when we come to the mystery of the Eucharist, we have to understand these two parts. Sometimes we talk about something and people say, oh, the, um, it's nice theory, but tell me how to apply it. Um, th it's important. And then other people say, you're talking too much about application, and, and I, I didn't learn anything new. So in general, we have to have both um, as a balance. So today, we'll talk about the three things, worship, spirit, and truth, okay? Or in other way, words, the center of worship, which is the liturgy as the center of worship, just a couple slides on this, and then the purpose of the mystery of the Eucharist. Um, again, what are the, the, the basic uh, foundational things that we receive from this so that when we attend liturgy, when we pray, um, in, in the church, we, we, we have more attention and it means more to us and we know what are, what are some of the things that we have to do more of in order to get more of a, a, a blessing from it, <clears throat> okay? So, um, and the purpose, we'll, we'll probably focus the most on the second part. Um, and actually what we'll do to remember um, is is we'll give the names of of the of the sacrament different names that we have for it and see how that applies um, to understanding the liturgy better or what it is. <clears throat> okay, so like um, like we did last week, I'll just kind of. Um, compile several t several quotes from different books, maybe to encourage, because they al always, the authors say it better than myself, um, but also to remind us of maybe if, if I like this quote or this author, I can go back to the reference, and uh, this is just some highlights of, of several books, so um, hopefully it will encourage us to read a little bit more. So Father Alexander Schmemann, Orthodox priest who departed, he said the liturgy is the crowning and fulfillment of the entire faith, the entire life, and the entire experience. So here's the orthodoxy, the worship, orthopraxy, right, of the church. And he's saying, what's at the top? What's the crown? The liturgy. Um, the Eucharist, and, and Abu Tedros Meleti, he also said the Eucharist is the epitome of every act of worship the church conducts. It is the act of Christ himself offered to the Father. <clears throat> um, so if it's so important, <laughs> then everything that we do in the church should stem from it, um, or at least should encourage people to grow more in the liturgy. So if you, well, 
I was telling the servants this before. If you have, if you're a great servant and people are coming and they the, they love you and they're growing in Christ, but they're not growing in their liturgical life, or they're not uh, they're attending liturgy less than before, or they care less about the sacraments, or they don't confess as much, then something is wrong with what you're doing. Um, Okay, same thing in our, in our church. If it's just a bunch of activities and, and it's distracting people from, from the liturgical life, then we're missing the mark. Uh, I'm saying uh, as the leaders of the church or the servants of the church. <coughs> okay, <coughs> um, another Orthodox theologian, um, he writes, this is the perfection of the life in Christ. So perfect is this mystery, so far does it excel every other sacred rite that it leads to the very summit of good things. Here also is the final goal of every human endeavor. So not just is it the peak of the life, it should be the peak of our, our life, uh, my, my personal life. Um, for in it we obtain God himself, and God is united with us in the most perfect union. We'll talk about the union in, 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 in a minute. Um, wherefore, the Eucharist alone of the sacred rites supplies perfection to the other mysteries. Okay? Um, so, um, this is why we focus so much on the service, especially if you go to other Orthodox or other apostolic churches, liturgy is the center. It shouldn't be the center. And if you take it away, there's no church. There's no bride of Christ. It, it makes the church the church, right? Um, <clears throat> and this is what unites the bride to the bridegroom. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb, as we say. Um, so a couple more slides on uh, quotes on this from the centrality, and we'll move on. Um, uh, historian uh, Philip Schaff, he wrote, um, the celebration of the Eucharist has occupied a foremost central position in Christian worship, not just Orthodox wor worship, but Christian worship. And unfortunately, other Christian groups have strayed from this focus. Um, and we, as traditional Orthodox Christians, have to say, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. The liturgy is the prime. If you go to Revelation, we, me we mentioned this uh, a while ago. If you look in the book of Revelation, um, do you find liturgy? Or something that looks like liturgy? Yes, you have the 24 priests r raising incense, falling on their faces. You have the four incorporeal creatures praising God. You have the angelic hosts. Everyone's basically taking turns glorifying God. Um, of course, you have to... Uh, you have to... Um, skip a few chapters when it talks about some of the things that happen on earth during the end of the world. Um, but um, there's a continual reminder in chapter four, chapter seven, ch like it, it, the, the evangelist, St. John, um, makes sure to remind us and of, of the revelation of Christ, not of what's gonna happen to this world, but what the world um, to come is, is awaiting. And in heaven, there is a liturgy, much better than what we have here, okay? Um, <clears throat> since, uh, and so another uh, father, Gregory Dix, he wrote a very beautiful compilation uh, a few decades ago um, about uh, the liturgy comparing several Orthodox, uh, not just Orthodox, or several apostolic traditional churches and how each one celebrates the liturgy over history. So if you're very uh, interested in research and depth, like this is, uh, this is m more of a resource for, for um, theologians. <laughs> it's a little sometimes over my head personally, but he has a, a lot of beautiful things. So anyway, he wrote, since, uh, um, since the, t the first liturgy on Holy Thursday, it has ever since been the essence and core of Christian work worship and Christian living. So here, orthodoxy and orthodoxy. Okay, um, one last quote on this. Um, again, in the life of Christ, um, he says, it is not possible to go beyond it or add anything to it. So, like if I say, okay, let, we've just finished the liturgy, now let's, even some churches or, or priests say, you know, um, it's better not to give, like what we're doing here, it's not better not to give a talk after the liturgy. Why? Because we're already here, and now we're going back down to the, the mental part. But of course, for practical reasons, um, we're, we're doing that here, but you, you understand the point of what um, uh, those priests are saying. is like, once you attain, it's kind of like um, after you've become, uh, you know, 
a professional in your field, you don't go back and study <laughs> like in high school. You're already past that. Maybe you go back to teach, but, but to learn in high school, no, you go back to you know, a university or something like that. Um, so he says, after Eucharist, there's nowhere further to go. They all must stand um, and try to examine the means by which we may preserve the treasure. So it's like you, you have a, a beautiful treasure that you found, and now you have to protect it and preserve it until the next time you receive more. Okay? And he says, for in it we attain God himself, and God is united with, with us in the most perfect union. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first point is it's the most important thing that w the church can give us and that God gives us himself. Um, and yes, the other sacraments have a taste or an experience with God, but nothing is more intimate and more personal and more powerful than the liturgy. So baptism is important. It's the doorway to all the mysteries um, and repentance and confession as well. Um, but why? Like, or how do we get our sins forgiven through the blood of Christ? How do we partake of the blood of Christ? Through the Holy Eucharist. Okay? Um, I think it makes sense, but again, these are just reminders for us. When people ask us, whether it's our children or our co-workers or anyone um, who asks us the reason for the hope that is in us. <clears throat> okay? Um, so, second part. What is the purpose? Um, in the beginning of the Liturgy of the Faithful, or the anaphora. Um, this is a very ancient dialogue between the priest and people in almost every apostolic church, e almost every church who has celebrated liturgy from the first, second century has this dialogue. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it. You know, the, pri it's the priest says, the Lord be with you all. And you say, and with your spirit, lift up your hearts. We have them with the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is uh, meet and right, right? So these are our three points. When Abuna is saying the Lord is be with you, he's saying we have communion with God, okay? Or we will have communion with God. Um, and when he says lift up your hearts, um, so either way you want to remember it, um, whether of what the priest says or what the names of the, the Eucharist uh, so one name is Eucharist, one name is the Divine Liturgy, which we'll get to. That's actually number four, but we'll save it for the third part. And then there's the anaphora. Um, and of course, I'll explain this terminology when we when we get to it, okay? Um, some people say Mass, we, we don't have that in the Orthodox Church. Um, it, and even the definition, I'm, I'm not clear of. I read some places it means and some places it means just to be sent. Um, but we don't use that terminology. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. It's just not in the Orthodox tradition. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, Holy Communion. Um, when, when, and this is the probably the most significant and essential of all of the things that we will say. Um, and John chapter 6, as we said before, uh, exemplifies uh, for any believer uh, the depth of this mystery. Okay? Um, the partaker is in communion with the Lord through the body and blood of uh, his, the Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for our salvation. And the purpose is unity. The purpose of the liturgy, one of the main purposes, is union with us and God and with one another, okay? And um, again, another Orthodox theologian, he says, uh, the Eucharist itself instituted by Christ at the Sepher on Holy Thursday to perpetuate the remembrance of his redemptive work and to establish a continuous intimate communion. That's the important part. Establish a continuous intimate communion between himself and those who believe in him. Um, so many of you probably experience this when you're far from the liturgical life, you feel far from God, and vice versa. The more you attend church, even if you get an opportunity to attend more than once in a week, you feel it. Um, uh, even as a priest, we, we feel the difference when only praying, you know, what you're usual, used to praying in a week, and if you add extra, we, we feel the extra, and the blessing from the extra. Not that it's... Uh, <laughs> weighing down physically, 
maybe there is a sacrifice, but spiritually there is a blessing always attached to it. This is one of the main blessings that the Lord um, wants to reveal to his children to encourage us. Um, I was just listening to a story about His Holiness Pope Krillos the Sixth of blessed memory. You know, he prayed every day. Uh, and there's a story of when he was traveling to Ethiopia. Of course, it's a long flight. And um, uh, the emperor was there to welcome him with, you know, pomp and circumstance. <laughs> um, and uh, the Pope gets off the flight plane. He was anxious. He, he's like running with the bread and the wine in his hand, going to pray liturgy. And he's like, what are you doing? He's like, I ha have to do this. This is, he was fasting on the plane just so he could go and pray liturgy. Who cares about the emperor? Of course, he spent time and in, in reverence to, to the emperor and to do whatever they have to, had to do, but his king was most and foremost <coughs> in his life. Um, okay, uh, St. Cyril in the Fraction to the Sun in the Divine Liturgy, um, by the way, there's a lot of beautiful, um, not only prayers, but theological teaching that we get from the prayer prayers themselves. And the more we attend, the more we pay attention, the more we learn about the liturgy. <coughs> um, for example, St. Cyril in his fraction, he writes, um, speaking to God, of course, you have granted us to eat your flesh openly, make us worthy to be united with you invisibly. Here's the the orthopraxy. You have granted us to drink of the cup of your blood openly, make us worthy to mingle with your purity invisibly. And as you are one in your Father and your Holy Spirit, may we be one in you and you in us, that your saying may be fulfilled, that they also may be one in us. The prayer from John 17. Um, again, the Bible is mixed with the, the mysteries and it mixed with the saintly um, lives of, of the saints of the church and mixed with the patristic writings. So what, that's the beauty of our church. When you find one link, it's connected to the rest and the purpose is to grow in Christ, okay? Um, there's many other verses. We don't have time to go into all of them, um, but just uh, for brevity, as St. Paul says, for we being many are one bread and one body. That's why in the church we don't have multiple breads or wafers. It's one body because we are one body in Christ, um, and we have one cup. Um, St. Paul talks about this in Corinthians, and so that's why no matter how many people we have, there should be only one cup. Um, for where two are, and uh, again, the union of the believer with God and the believers with one another, when the Lord said, if two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. <coughs> okay, um, that's the first name of the liturgy, right? Or what we receive from it, Holy Communion, okay? We get union with God. The second one is called the anaphora. Anyone know what that means? I'm sorry? Yes, you, you were in the servant's meeting. <laughs> so very good, you remember, okay? So it's kind of like a heavenly elevator. Bas basically, it mean, uh, um, fora comes from Christopher, which means to, to gather or to bear or to hold, and anna means to go up. So basically, so it's kind of like something that is gathering us and lifting us up uh, to heaven. And when Abuna says lift up your hearts, he uses the same Greek um, term for this, okay? Ano imon taskartias, okay? Um, so our hearts should be lifted up to heaven. Um, and the at this point, um, in time, in the liturgy, and we'll hopefully we'll have a time where we go more in depth each step of the liturgy, but what is happening in the altar? There's a hint. <laughs> the covering that was used to, to um, remember the burial of Christ is lifted up. In the early church, this was used to collect the gifts and the offerings from the people um, uh, at the same time. <clears throat> uh, so we're lifting up this covering and we're lifting up our hearts so that God may be, and the church is being lifted up to heaven, okay? Um, as St. John Chrysostom says, what is heaven to me when I contemplate the master of heaven, when I myself become heaven? Um, so that's the purpose of the liturgy is for us to become heaven. How? <laughs> Wherever God is, there's heaven, right? So if he's in you, you're heaven uh, of, of sorts. 
okay? Um, and even in some of the hymns, we call Saint, Saint Mary the second heaven because the Lord dwelt in her womb for, for nine months. Okay. Um, we don't have time to go into the depth of the concept of this offering and lifting up. Um, again, I'm scratching the surface, but there are layers and layers of depth to this, which when we attend more and more, or contemplate more and more, or read more and more um, uh, about this stuff, it, it begins to, to sink in. But I'm just kind of like highlighting some of the things that we remember and recognize um, before or w when we pray in the liturgy. <clears throat> okay, the last thing, oh sorry, there's just a couple more quotes about the lifting up. Um, Oh, yes, so Father Alexander Schmem in another one of his books, For the Life of the World, he says, uh, it's kind of a lengthy quote, but it's, it's very nice. He says, the early Christians realized that they must ascend to heaven where Christ has ascended. This ascension was the very condition of their mission of the world, of their ministry to the world. Again, I'm putting it in blue because when we feel this and experience this, it, it is seen in our daily life, okay? Okay. Um, for there in heaven, they were immersed in the new life of the kingdom. And when, after this liturgy of ascension, they returned into the world, their faces reflected the light and the joy and peace of that kingdom, and they were truly its witnesses. So our main job, after attending liturgy, taking communion, leaving, is to be the witness of what we had experienced, whether by word or deed or just our, ourself. Um, says they brought no programs, no theories, but wherever they went, the seeds of the kingdom sprouted, faith was kindled, life was transfigured, things impossible were made possible. They were witnesses, and when they were asked, what sh wh whence shines this light? Where is the source of this power? They knew what to answer and where to lead men. Um, again, this is a high calling for us, is to have such an impact in our life that when we go to work or school, you know, on Monday, what's what's different with you? How come you're changed? You look bright, you look happier, you look, uh, it's, and then you have an answer. Um, of course, this this doesn't happen, uh, um, at least personally to me, very, very much, despite the dress and everything, um, but this is the goal, okay? And it says, in church today, we often, he says, we so often find we meet the only same world, not Christ and his kingdom. We don't realize that we never get anywhere because we never leave any place behind us. What does he mean by this? Is in order to go up, uh, we have to come to Christ. He says, in order to leave, come. This is the beginning, the starting point of the sacrament, the condition of its transforming power and reality. So on a practical level, the orthopraxy part, During the liturgy, the more effect it has in us to be transforming. Um, not that we're doing it wrong, but we could always do it better. Uh, I'm, again, I speak to myself first and foremost. <clears throat> um, some people say, oh, I'm coming to the church for the kids. Yes, but it's not just for them, it's for us too. We need it as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, he continues by saying, the liturgy of the Eucharist is, the b is best to understand, uh, sorry, best understood as a journey or procession. It is the journey of Christ, the church, into the dimension of the kingdom. So he's, he gives the example of when you go from sec two dimensions to three dimensions, um, what is added, something new, something that helps you see it better or experience that thing better. So he's saying in, in what is that third dimension? He says that's, or the fourth dimension, he says that's the risen life of Christ or the resurrection. He says the presence, the presence of that extra dimension allows us to see much better the actual reality. Um, it says, or he says, entrance into a fourth dimension which allows us to see the ultimate reality of life, to see more deeply into the reality of the world. So this is another way of saying, um, we see differently, or we experience life at a different level. Um, forgive me if I'm 
uh, asking, uh, putting up the bar too high to expect more of us, but at least this is what we strive in our personal liturgical life. Um, finally, at the end of the liturgy, of Buddha says, given for salvation, remission of sins, eternal life. This we shouldn't forget, and this is what we preach, and this is what we, we try to experience. Salvation, remission of sins, eternal life. Um, and if anyone asks you, why do you believe this? There's plenty of biblical verses, and here is uh, just a few. Um, so that is the lifting up, the anaphora, right? The last and probably most common term that we have for the liturgy is what? Starts with the E. <laughs> Eucharist. Anyone know what Eucharist means? Yes, very good. To, uh, Thanksgiving, okay? So every, every day is Thanksgiving in our church, right? Um, <clears throat> and when Abuna says, let us give thanks to the Lord, he's saying, let us Eucharist. Let's a, let, let us liturgy um, in, in a manner of speaking. Um, and the people say, yes, it's, it's, meter, it's, it's proper and it's, it's uh, good for us to do this. Um, okay, and... In all the liturgies, like we said, the Eucharist governs the whole rite from the beginning to the end. The prayers of the Eucharist often begin with, let us give thanks to the Lord. And the congregation responds saying, it's me and right. Um, uh, St. John Chrysostom, he says, when I call it Thanksgiving, they used to call this again from for centuries, I unfold the treasures of God's goodness and call to mind, or call the mind to meditate on those mighty gifts. So oftentimes we think of liturgy, okay, I have to go and pray and ask for this, or I need to go and get a blessing. Yes, oh, that's, that, that we receive all those things from the liturgy, but, um, or if something really good happens to you, how do you thank God with liturgy? We, we, the Eucharist is, is the climax of our at least acknowledging how good he is. We see it in the liturgical life. Um, I think it goes without saying, but um, the one who comes and always says thank you is the one who, if they say it from the bottom of their heart, they are acknowledging that they have received something important. Um, so in our life, if we're not doing this enough to God, then that means maybe we don't recognize all that he is doing in our life. Uh, the scholar Origen, he says, we are not people with ungrateful hearts. The sign of our gratitude towards God is the bread called the Eucharist. So this is the sign of our, our gratitude. Um, and uh, Father Shmemon also says, when man stands before the throne of God, all joy is restored. Then there is nothing else for him to offer but to give thanks. It's like, you're so happy. You have everything that you have because you have Christ with you. So the simple response is the Eucharist, is the giving of thanks. Hence, the Eucharist or Thanksgiving is the state of the perfect man. So day and the rest of my life, that's not necessarily the goal. The goal is to to have that state of mind always present with us. The 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 mind of the thanksgiving, okay? Um, Abuna Tadros says it also very uh, succinctly when he says, man as a priest, so in, in the general priesthood of the sense, receives the world as a divine gift, um, illustrating God's fatherhood and God's love for him and offers his whole life as a Eucharistic sacrifice. So when we give thanks, there is a sacrifice, there's an offering. Um, or a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. And so uh, it's kind of like we were saying the cycle. We receive from God and we give thanks back to him. We're, he's always giving and we're always receiving, but we're not necessarily always giving thanks. And sometimes this is just related to either not recognizing it or uh, the ego or focusing on the, the distractions in the world 
or losing our relationship with God and thereby the Eucharistic life. Um, so there has to be acknowledgement, there has to be repentance, there has to be offering, there has to be sacrifice. Um, and, and that's how the cycle uh, remains uh, strong. Um, and that leads to the next part. Well, how is the liturgy an offering? Um, before that, we'll just one, one other, other quote from uh, Bishop Ioannis. He says, as the Israelites were fed with man in the wilderness until they entered the promised land, so does the Holy Communion feed our souls and protect us in the, until we reach the heavenly Jerusalem. So, um, okay. Uh, last point. The last point is um, the liturgy, the word liturgy itself, it means work of the people. So that means there has to be something that we do. A lot of what we do is the actual uh, things in the liturgy, like the hymns, the prayers, coming early, the offerings, all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but it, the reminder here is that this is a service um, that's done by the people for the people and with the people and with all the people of God or and all for all the people of God. Um, I won't go into the to the depth, but I'll just maybe um, uh, for brevity uh, skip a couple of things. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, again, Father Alexander, he says the lit liturgia of ancient Israel was the corporate work of a chosen few to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. The church itself is a liturgy, a ministry, and a calling to act in this world after the fashion of Christ. So, um, there has so the more we work, like towards this liturgical life, the more blessing we get out of it. The more you put in, the more you get out. Um, um, again, Father Alexander, he says, God not only saves us in Christ, not only forgives our sins, He also transforms our life. So the person who is living liturgy properly has their life changed. Uh, sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. Um, he says, it is in the Feast of the Transfiguration that we find the ultimate meaning of the Orthodox idea of salvation. I like this quote a lot because it applies to our church. The, just the name of the church or the event of the Transfiguration shows how our life should always be changed. Okay. Um, and the lit idea that the liturgy is supposed to make me holy and transform me, not just transform the body, uh, the bread and wine, but transform me as well. Okay, um, coming to a close, uh, he also says, the one action which is from the beginning has been for the church both the source and fulfillment of joy. So it's the source of our joy, okay? Um, the very sacrament of joy, the Eucharist. The, the Eucharist is the entrance of the church into the joy of the Lord. So um, you probably might not uh, have heard this before, but after a deacon or a priest or a bishop is ordained, what is the first thing that we make them do? You notice? First we say, okay, bow down before the altar. <laughs> and then what? Uh, especially you see this more w with the, the, the priest because there's only a few, but the bishop will take him by the hand and tell him and, and escort him into the altar and say, and he says, enter into the joy of your Lord. But he, well, he's for, he just made you a worker. <laughs> like, uh, he didn't say, okay, do, go do your job. No, this is, this is the joy. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're trying to say by the liturgy is yes, there's a sacrifice and there's an offering and there's a job to be done, but it's entering into the joy of our Lord, okay? Um, and this is also a deep quote. He says at the end, this is the sacrament by which it becomes what it is. I, I'm not gonna inter uh, just think about that, but basically we become what we are through the liturgy, okay? Um, just maybe give you a few weeks <laughs> to think uh, about that. Okay. Um, I think we can uh, conclude here, but or maybe for another time we can do this. Um, 
the work doesn't have success until unless there is preparation or to feel or to be worthy we're not worthy but just the sense of feeling that we are unworthy is part of the preparation that we have to do in order to receive worthily okay um, and so that's why not everyone is given the um, permission to partake of communion because sometimes it can be a, a condemnation to that person or um, basically St. Paul says it better um, in, in the next slide. He says, let a man examine himself um, because we can be found to partake in an unworthy manner. That's scary stuff. And I, I, I don't venture to say any of us are partaking in an unworthy manner, but that we should try to partake in a more worthy manner. Okay? Um, by So think God, believe in we're baptized. Maybe we need to um, renew our our commitment to baptism but the number two is probably Um, and she was probably in, in that room the closest one to him. Um, okay, um, so uh, I already talked about this. So in summary, um, we worship in spirit and truth. The centrality of the liturgy, how central is it in my life compared to now I understand it's the center of the church, but what about my life? Um, <clears throat> that the purpose is for me to be closer, to ascend, um, and to, to be thankful. And then finally, the application in my life, there should be joy, there should be transformation, and there should be better preparation. Um, any questions? I know it went a little over today, um, but uh, this was something that I gave the servants, and we're saying, okay, Let's just put this as a goal for you know this coming year. Let's try to see how we could do this better. Let's try to attend more liturgies if possible. And if there's a time that that you suggest that might help you, like early in the morning or whatever, can't necessarily do late at night because it's hard to do that until unless we're in the late in the Lent. Um, to attend with as many members or all the members of your family as you can. Regardless of the time, like Abuna was saying, like the noise is not the issue. The issue is that you come with your family to pray to God, um, to try to come earlier, or at the time when we start, not at the time when it's okay to take communion or to dress. Um, uh, and then to prepare ahead of time, I didn't mention that. Okay, um, or even the liturgy starts with Vespers, <laughs> try to, to every once in a while bring your family to the evening uh, service um, don't get discouraged um, yes it's a tall order but all we're saying is we could do it better and the more effort you put into doing liturgy better the better you will be the better your family will be the better this church will be uh, and glory be to god and from him to the each age any questions okay we'll pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Finally, Lord, we lift up our hearts and our, uh, to you, and we th give thanks to you for your gracious gifts that you always offer to us. And we seek you to transform us and to unite us and to grant us your joy in every good thing. You uh, are never short of granting us your blessings, but we are short of acknowledging them and giving thanks to you for them and seeking the power that is in them, whether of ignorance or of pride or of laziness. Help us remove those obstacles that separate us from you and from the blessings of the Eucharistic life and give us the power and zeal and desire to 
unite with you more intimately, more uh, on a daily basis until we live with you forever. Through the intercession of the Holy Mother of God, St. Mary, St. Mary is all the choir of your saints and the blessing of the Holy Transfiguration. Make us, O Lord, worthy to pray with all thanksgiving. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace and the peace of God.